Hello, I'm Philip Kahn. I'm your sociology professor and here to talk about health disparities in general and make some connections to the COVID-19 pandemic. Brief lecture, I'll make some connections for you and see if you can take it further from there. There's my contact information. Feel free to get in touch. Happy to talk about all these issues with you later. Uh, what are health disparities? What do we mean when we talk about health disparities? Well, uh, the Centers for Disease Control has a nice definition I like, which is that health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health. So things that make you sick or injured or violently harmed, or things that prevent you from getting uh, the kind of health that you should be able to get on your own. All those things experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. So they're connected to wider issues of inequality and they are disparities in health. So we usually, uh, we often talk about them in terms of health outcomes, things like mortality or being sick or being injured or having cancer or things like that. So health disparities. And you'll see in your daily life, a lot of stories about inequalities in health and the healthcare system, things like uh, a nursing home resident who deserved a better death than the one um, uh, they had from uh, coronavirus, or how junk food makes us sicker, or how Obamacare, a policy um, change that the federal government did, may have prevented deaths in the opioid epidemic, which we'll talk about a little bit more, or how we have a problem of maternal mortality that is women dying in or around childbirth in this country, and, and different groups experience that at different rates, or how preventable cancers may be on the rise, in this case, a story about Alabama. So all these things are issues of health disparities and things that will come up in your daily life or around the news and so on. So that's kind of what motivates us today. Um, for the framework, I'm gonna use something called the theory of fundamental causes, um, which sounds in a way bigger than it is. It's not a theory of the whole universe. It's a theory about health disparities in particular. And it really tries to answer the question of the relationship between socioeconomic status and health outcomes. That is why is our general inequality in society so persistently associated with health inequality, inequality in things like um, uh, illness and death. Now, the context for this is that overall, our living standards have been improving uh, in the long run. Um, some of that is old changes like the introduction of water and sewer systems or improved nutrition, things like refrigeration and freezing and canning and all that stuff made a huge difference 100 years ago. Um, a lot of improvements in medicine and medical technology and understanding of medicine, and also in terms of education as the population's education has improved, we're better able to um, uh, incorporate information, learn how to take better care of ourselves, for example, by smoking less uh, or eating better. So you can see the chart there, just the very, in the very general sense, uh, in about 120 years, our life expectancy in this country has gone from a little less than 50 to almost 79 years. The average person born um, today, if nothing changed, would live about 79 years. We hope actually things will get better um, during those 79 years, but we don't know for sure. So why, as um, uh, things have gotten better, is there still such a strong relationship between health outcomes and socioeconomic status, or, or, or why are, are, are other inequalities still so strongly associated with health inequality? So um, the answer that the, that the theory of fundamental causes gives us is that income and education, which is sort of the building blocks of socioeconomic status, bring more resources that are beneficial to health. So money, knowledge, prestige, power, uh, and benef beneficial social connections. So who you know, who you interact with, who you learn from, who helps you and who you help. Um, all of those things are um, uh, uh, resources that people with higher socioeconomic status have that people with lower socioeconomic status have less of and that improve their health. Um, and the key thing, the, the key insight of this theory is that as the health system evolves and as our general health has improved, socioeconomic status is still enabling those with more resources to have better outcomes than those with worse resources or fewer resources. So um, it, it's a moving target, but this helps explain why we always have that gap. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, uh, when you look, uh, uh, here's a study that looked at people who were born in 1960 and asked, what is the chance, if they made it to age 50, what's the chance they would make it to age 85? And it compared um, that chance by their incomes. And so you can see here, it's by men and women, and the, the population is divided into income fifths, the poorest fifth of the population, the second, the middle fifth, the fourth fifth, and the fifth, the richest fifth. 
And you can see that the richer men and women have a much higher chance of making it from age 50 to age 85. 77% chance in the case of women, 66% chance in the case of men, but down in the poorest fifth, it's much lower, only about 30% um, uh, of them are expected to make it from age 50 to age 85. So a very big difference by social, social class in life expectancy, in this case of people who made it to age 50. So people with higher family incomes live longer, and the reasons for this are their better living conditions, their better health care, and their better health behavior that's partly facilitated by their resources um, and including education. Here's another one um, specifically about health behavior, smoking. Uh, uh, people who uh, uh, smoke um, uh, obviously are at risk for um, uh, uh, lung cancer and other health problems. And you can see here a very strong gradient on education. So people with graduate degrees, only 37% of them smoke. And as you move down the education ladder, you get the people all the way down with GEDs, the general education degree, 36% of them smoke. So a very strong um, education gradient. Um, and and, and uh, we see this with a number of other health behaviors also. So we assume part of what's happening is through the process of education, people learn better health behavior, but also um, who they interact with, the circles they, they go in, and the other, the other resources they have access to are helping to promote these um, better health behaviors if you have more education. Um, here's a long run um, uh, disparity where we can talk about infant mortality and race, um, especially uh, specifically blacks and whites. So infant mortality is uh, 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 the death of a baby between birth and age one. Um, so you can see in 1850, uh, 340 out of every thousand black babies born uh, were estimated to not make it to their first year. So about a third versus 217 of the white babies. And you can see this tremendous progress um, really for both groups since 1850 to 2017, which is not too surprising. But you also see that race gap persisting all the way along. So it was um, 340 to 217 in 1850, all the way down now to 11, only 11 out of every thousand black babies don't make it to their first year, tragically, but that's still more than twice the five out of every thousand white babies that don't make it to the end of their first year. So as infant mortality has declined, that gap has persisted, and that's really what the theory of fundamental causes would predict. And we can look at the specific mechanisms that drive this, for example, the living condition, differences between blacks and whites, um, things that contribute to their overall health, um, including nutrition and healthcare and uh, um, uh, the occupations that they work in and so on, and then discrimination in all various forms of life, from everywhere from where people live to their education to the healthcare system and so on. So we can, we can look at that, the influence of those factors all the way through time, even as the situation has gotten better, the, the gap is persisting. It doesn't mean it inevitably will, but it's just what we, um, what we have seen so far. And so we're not surprised if we keep seeing it. Um, a, a more recent um, uh, concern has been uh, the dramatic, until this year with the coronavirus epidemic, the dramatic um, uh, opioid epidemic that we had in the last 20 years or so in this country. Um, this map shows uh, where there are the most uh, opioid overdose deaths um, uh, uh, in the population. And you can see they're very concentrated, especially in Appalachia um, and other economically distressed areas, sort of places where um, the industrial economy has, um, uh, has collapsed or shrank or disappeared. So you see those other areas in the upper Midwest, for example. Um, so uh, that's a case where um, the resources available to people at the local level in their geography um, are, are contributing to their worst health. So it's having lost jobs, um, having less opportunities, and then also having had opioids introduced, for example, when people get injured on the job. Um, and all of that has snowballed into um, um, a massive epidemic of, of addiction to opioids, um, whether uh, prescription drugs or heroin or fentanyl, other legal drugs. Fentanyl could be prescription too. Okay, so that's a, that's a taste of a few different um, uh, uh, health disparities and things that we look at by education, by, um, by income, by race, and um, by geography. So that sort of sets us up a little bit to talk about what's going on now with the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic that we're dealing with now, and the reason why you may be watching this video. Um, just a little bit of background, the coronavirus um, uh, in, is, is, a, is a group of diseases um, uh, that affects humans and other species, okay? So we have this group of viruses, some of them are very mild and some of them are quite serious, like the one we're dealing with now. This one is the novel coronavirus 2019, was discovered in Wuhan, China in late 2019. Um, we now call um, the disease that that virus causes COVID-19. 
um, there's a couple of references there you can follow. So that's just for background what we're talking about. And the key thing when we're looking at disparities in how this disease spreads and the impact that it has is to think about um, the mechanics of how it works. I'm not going to get into it in great detail, but basically, like other coronaviruses, we assume this one spreads through droplets in the air, um, very small, um, uh, when someone coughs or sneezes or touches a surface where it has droplets on it or transfers um, virus um, from, uh, from their body to something that ends up in somebody else's um, hands and then into their, um, uh, into their mouth or something like that. Um, we don't know for a fact, but it seems also um, that there, there, there's good evidence now that it's also spread um, uh, among people who are, since we don't know for a fact, we do know for a fact, we don't know how much, um, that it is spread by asymptomatic patients, that is people who show no symptoms. To some degree, there are people with no symptoms, you can't tell they're sick, but who are nevertheless transmitting the virus. And also, um, sometimes rather than just a literal drop of liquid that flies through the air, sometimes aerosolized droplets, more like um, tiny particles that float in the air. So that's one reason why, those two things are reasons why we think this is very contagious and spreads um, a lot when people are just sort of close to each other. Okay, um, now why is this um, disease so bad that it has become a global pandemic? Well, um, it's a novel, it's brand new, it's a novel coronavirus, so no one is immune to it. Um, uh, it's highly contagious, that is, if you put people together and one is infected and the other is not, um, uh, it's very likely that the disease transmits from one to the other. That issue of the asymptomatic transmission, so it's spreading even when people don't know they're sick, um, uh, especially um, uh, they're perfectly healthy uh, seeming and they move all around in the population instead of sort of being, oh, I feel terrible, I'm gonna just lie here still and, have, and be sick. That's a much better um, for containing a disease. Um, and then the reason we care so much about this is that it really does have relatively high mortality. We don't know the rates exactly, but we know it's pretty high compared to other um, viruses going around. So you can see the chart here that shows um, really from the end of January with very low numbers, this rocketing up of, of deaths associated with COVID-19, now up, up over 160,000 deaths. Um, the United States, which has the worst epidemic of any country in the world, um, uh, is up to about 40,000 deaths as I speak. Um, and so we have a very serious uh, problem with COVID-19 here. So let's talk a little bit about disparities. Um, the epidemic, uh, interestingly, started in richer parts of the country. So it's not like um, uh, other things where you would expect uh, poor people from our previous discussion would end up uh, immediately worse off. This disease started in coastal metropolitan areas, especially Seattle, San Francisco area, New York, and from there it spread throughout the country, also hopping to other metropolitan areas like Detroit, Chicago, New Orleans, Los Angeles, and it is now spreading throughout um, the rest of the country. So um, about 80% of counties um, uh, have had uh, uh, coronavirus cases now, um, and you can see if you look closely at the chart, there's a lot of places where there's a dark county in the middle and some lighter counties around it. So it's sort of someone has flown to a particular city, Columbus, Ohio or something, and then it has spread to the suburbs from there. So that's sort of the path it has taken, not really um, uh, affecting uh, the poorest areas first. So interestingly, starting in richer places, some of the counties outside New York are some of the richest parts of the country. Um, we've had some very specific outbreaks. And here we start to see some inklings of the disparities in this outcome. Nursing homes have been tremendously hard hit. Um, places where people can't move to get away, where they don't have the resources or they're not aware that they have an infection until it's too late, and where the patients are very vulnerable to the, this particular disease. So New York State has produced this list of, of nursing home deaths um, in counties in New York, and you see several thousand people already have died um, in nursing homes um, in, in, in New York State. Um, in a way similar, although a very different population, obviously, has been prisons. Some very big outbreaks. Um, as I speak now, the largest outbreak in the country is at the Marion um, a prison, a State Prison in uh, Ohio, um, with 1,800 uh, prisoners infected. Um, uh, another big one in the Cook County Jail in Chicago and many other in prisons and jails where captive populations in close quarters um, get infected and the, the staff either can't or doesn't um, take the steps necessary to um, isolate people um, and keep the disease from spreading. Um, and then we see 
A third case, which is also in a way similar, um, factories where people have been, are, are stuck together in small spaces for long periods of time, also breathing a lot, sweating, and so on. Um, in the case of meatpacking, there's a, a large Smithfield plant in South Dakota, it's had about 800 cases. Another meatpacking plant in Greeley, Colorado, and many other um, situations like that where they've had outbreaks that are um, at particular workplaces. So you can see here populations that are vulnerable in some sense because of the kind of job they have, because of the place where they're confined, either because of uh, the criminal justice system or because of their health that leaves them vulnerable to the spread. And then in the case of nursing homes, especially to the negative outcomes um, of being very, very sick. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we get disparities in the coronavirus uh, uh, um, specifically. So the physical concentration is one key issue. Um, uh, another big issue has been workers who are exposed to, e to each other a lot, but also especially when they're exposed to um, people who are already sick. And this is um, the healthcare workers, especially doctors and nurses and, um, and nursing assistants and other uh, wor workers in hospitals, um, but also service workers, people who work in um, uh, restaurants and grocery stores and uh, make deliveries uh, and uh, any kind of service provision that involves um, uh, being close with other workers and especially being close with members of the public. Um, uh, and then uh, in that category of exposed workers are really anybody who can't do their work from home like I'm doing now in my home studio delivering a lecture. A lot of people's jobs simply don't allow that or they don't have the resources or the liberty to do that and so their job puts them at risk. Um, and then the other kind of disparity we have is uh, even separate from who gets infected is from how badly people are affected once they um, once they have the disease. It's a respiratory disease, um, so it, it, it affects the lungs. And so people who have asthma or other breathe, breathing problems, a high blood pressure, um, which makes it difficult to recover from lung infections, any kind of compromised immunity, so then that affects their immune reaction to the disease, um, and uh, or age, that simply um, a lot of these things accumulate in older, in older people. So if you take people who have any kind of health, any of these categories of health, problems in the first place and you add the disease, um, the, the impact will be worse. So it's not only who gets it, but how bad the impact is. Um, I'm gonna jump into this video now to talk about the problem of paid sick leave. The CDC came out with clear instructions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And at the top of the list is to stay home when you're sick. But a lot of American workers don't have that option. 27% of private sector workers don't get paid sick leave. And that's gonna make this pandemic a lot more problematic than it needs to be. Over 30 million workers in the US don't get paid sick days. That's not the way it has to be. The US is one of only two OECD countries without federally mandated paid sick leave. So taking off can mean you can't pay your bills and calling sick can get you fired. So what does that mean when there's a highly contagious disease circulating like right now? It means people who are sick may be going to work and risking infecting their coworkers, their customers, the people they teach, or the people they care for. And it gets worse. Those 30 million or so people without paid sick leave, they're most concentrated in low wage jobs and in industries that are the most likely to involve the risk of contagion. Restaurant workers, hotel workers, people who work in transportation, travel, and tourism. Less than half of Americans doing restaurant, leisure, and hospitality work have paid sick leave. And for the bottom 10% of wage earners overall, only 30% do. With the coronavirus crisis we're going through today, paid sick leave isn't just the right policy for workers, it's essential to our public health. Thank you to Elise Gould from the Economic Policy Institute. Um, she's talking about the policy problem there that the law does not require people to, to get paid sick, um, uh, paid sick leave from their employers and so you end up um, putting workers at risk and the people that they work with. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, uh, does a survey where they ask, one of the questions they ask people is, um, do you work at home? Could you work at home? And using that question, can you work at home? Um, they broke it down by occupation, education, and race, ethnicity, and I, I have that for you here. Um, it shows us that the more prestigious occupations, people with higher education, and in terms of race, ethnicity, especially Asians and whites, um, are, are most likely to be able to work from home. So managers and professionals, um, sales and office workers, much more than blue collar jobs of 
of transportation that's driving trucks and production factories and um, service hands-on service jobs and construction and so on. And then a huge education disparity in this issue of can you work from home? People with college degrees, over half of them have jobs where they could work from home. Um, uh, they, they say they could work from home if they needed to, all the way down to um, uh, about 5% from people whose jobs have less than a high school degree. So um, when you get this instruction of you should stay home, or you should work from home, or we're trying to keep people working from home, we immediately have this vast inequality that opens up in terms of who is working at home and who is out there interacting with people, putting themselves and others at risk. Um, and then the race ethnic, ethnic breakdowns um, um, uh, sort of go along with those um, occupation, uh, those map to those occupation and education disparities. So that's not, um, that's not too surprising. I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, finally about the black-white difference, um, the disparate black impact. Um, uh, African-Americans have been um, affected um, uh, dramatically more, especially than whites, um, from what we know so far. It's very early days as far as the data that we have available, but we can start to see um, based somewhat on geography, but also some places are, rec are reporting their data out by race. Who died? What was the race of the people who died? Here's just five places, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Louisiana, New York State, and then New York City specifically, sort of going up um, in places that have had more and more um, serious outbreaks. And you can see in every case, um, Blacks are much more likely to have lost their lives from coronavirus than whites are um, in all these places. And there are a few others that are collecting this data uh, uh, as well. So we're seeing this disparate impact. We wanna talk a little bit about why we would. Um, uh, uh, what would, what, what, and what about this fundamental cause theory would help explain that? Okay. Um, so the poor resources, um, especially um, uh, regarding living conditions, would already have conditioned um, blacks to have worse health than whites, so they're more vulnerable to the impacts. Remember that chart I just showed you was deaths, not infections. So those are the people who actually died, and that means most likely they had some kind of health problem uh, going into it. Um, uh, the lower levels of education and discrimination in terms of what jobs people have, um, what, whether they have jobs with benefits or flexibility or ability to work from home and all those things that we were just talking about, racially unequally distributed by race. Um, the, the workplace policies themselves, where, where um, uh, do they work for an employer that, um, that uh, allows flexibility, that, uh, that provides sick leave uh, and so on. So we, there's racial disparity in that also. And then um, the healthcare system itself, the earlier healthcare um, or a lack of healthcare, because we still live in a country where a lot of people don't have health insurance, um, affect outcomes not only before they get sick, but when they also, when they get sick. So the hospital they go to, the doctor they go to, when they, uh, when they already have um, the coronavirus, COVID-19, the disease. So these are all reasons why we would expect the lack of resources, uh, in this case associated with blacks compared to whites, um, uh, that blacks have versus whites will have uh, created this disparate impact in terms of the impact of the coronavirus. Um, uh, and, and this is just a taste of one particular um, uh, disparate impact in, um, in terms of the difference between blacks and whites. But as this epidemic unfolds uh, through this country and around the world, that gives us a taste of the kind of things we're going to look for to understand this and many other disparities that we're likely to see. Thank you for listening.